today we're welcoming Dr. Ellen Berger back again uh, to continue our look at the emotional sobriety and 12 steps um, from an, emo- well, we're looking at emotional sobriety from the 12 step standpoint. And Alan is going to give us his take on step one, the principle and the core value of the emotional sobriety. Uh, We heard Herb Kagan speak with us last week or last month about the same thing. And the the process is Herb speaks one month, then Alan comes the next month, and then the two of them come together. They'll be here in July to um, talk about it and further share with us. So I am really glad to see Alan, and I know he's glad to see you all and share his wisdom and also his strength and hope. So, Alan, I'm really glad to see you. Come on in. Do I have to? I got to unmute myself. So make sure you make me co-host so I can share. We already did. We did. You guys are a step ahead of me as usual. Um, We know you. Well, I, I hope to be able to shed some light on this very important step in our journey in recovery. Um, I'm not so sure how much strength I can share today. You know, as you know, Susie, I've been going through a lot and in my own personal crisis in many ways. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but talked about that elsewhere. So, um, But I will share my understanding of what's going on with this step, how I've looked at it after being in this program for uh, almost 52 years now. So this August, I'm coming up on my 52nd birthday. And I'm just really glad to say that I've just spent a whole week dealing with this personal crisis I'm facing with my sponsor, Tom, in Hawaii. And he's the gentleman who brought me in the program back in 1971. So that's the kind of relationships and that can be cemented and developed in this program. I mean, my God, I don't think there's anybody on this planet that knows me better than Tom. And it was very, very helpful and helped me get grounded and helped me face the challenges that are coming down the pike here. So, um, and I appreciated all the support. I know many, many of you that are here have reached out to me and and gave me well wishes. And from every one of you, I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. So let's jump right into step one and talk about this. And, you know, Susie, I don't mind if you want to say more about the personal crisis, if you wanted to write something in the chat while I focus on this. But if I start talking about that, I'll cry for the whole hour and a half. And I'd rather I'd rather share with you guys what I want to talk about. So if you have questions, Susie Susie might be able to answer some of those. Well, let's go ahead and get into talking about the 12 steps here and emotional sobriety. Um, And to begin this, I I just want to take you through a little bit of a journey, you know, into putting this in context, right? I think the context of our, of this work that we're doing and that Herb and I are trying to bring to you is important. So it's very, very, I think, essential to our understanding of what is happening how the steps are impacting us and how they're changing us. They're changing us in the direction of discovering and achieving emotional sobriety in our life. Now, people will say, well, God, Alan, you know, when you say that, you're not saying that the purpose of this program is to help you find a a loving God, as you understand it. Uh, I get that. I, I understand that it's wrong. But that loving God is in service of helping us Find a way to achieve emotional sobriety. Let me close my door. My dog is barking. Hold on one second. Rocky. Stop. Uh Uh-uh. Maddie. Sorry about that interruption. So as I said, is that what we're really, what we're looking at here is how do the steps help us discover and achieve emotional sobriety? That's the purpose of this workshop that Herb and I are going to be doing for 
I maybe the rest of our lives. Who knows? It seems like we're here forever now. And we want to continue to be here with you guys as long as that's possible. So Bill even stated this in the 12 and 12 when he said, here we begin to practice all the 12 steps of the program in our daily lives so that we and those about us may find emotional sobriety. So, excuse me, that's the explicit, right, goal of the program is to discover and to find and integrate these principles of emotional sobriety into our daily lives. You know, I'm, I'm sure needing to do that in my life today, and these things are lifesavers for me. So what is emotional sobriety? Well, I think it's a practice that evolves and I'm okay if consciousness, which is where I think we all start our life from, into a consciousness that says, I'm okay even if. Now, it sounds like that jump should be so easy from I'm okay if to just adding one more word, even if, right? Well, that word even is a big, big word. It's a big, big word, and it's going to take a lot of work in our on ourselves a lot of work about our attitude, a lot of work about our perception to be able to develop a consciousness that creates that kind of an emotional freedom. And that's what our work is about. So Bill's most comprehension, comprehensive definition of emotional sobriety, <clears throat> excuse me, was defined in a letter he wrote in 19, well, he actually wrote the letter in 1953, somebody told me, I've got to correct that. And it was published then in the AA Grapevine in 1958. They changed a few things on it, but for the most part, it's intact. We titled The Next Frontier Emotional Sobriety. And I'm just going to take a couple snippets from this just to define emotional sobriety. So Bill describes emotional sobriety in this way. He calls it real maturity and balances in our lives, which is to say humility in relationship with ourselves, other and with life and with God. I add it with life in it because I think we need to include that this maturity and balance needs to show up in every area of our life, in relationship with ourselves, in relationship with the problems that we encounter in life, the challenges we get, in our relationship with other people, and our relationship with life when life occurs. When life sets challenges and tasks before us that we have to deal with, and with our relationship with our God or a God of our understanding. This is the way he said it. I think many oldsters who have put our booze cure to severe but successful tests still find that they often lack emotional sobriety. Perhaps they will be the spearhead for the next major development in AA, the development of much more real maturity and balance, which is to say, humility, in our relations with ourselves, with our fellows, and with God. So this was the second time I could find the phrase emotional sobriety. He first used it in the 12 and 12. I'm certain when he talked at meetings that he was using that phrase quite often. Then he defines it, right, as hoping that it would spearhead the next major development. Well, it did not do that in the 50s. I think we are seeing evidence that we're getting towards the tipping point now, thanks to Patrick and all of those of you who have put this workshop together, thanks to the workshop I do on every Thursday evening. I'm sure that link will be put in the chat, but it's at a god-awful time for all of you in Europe and stuff like that. But all of the, the first 30 or 40 minutes of discussion in that meeting are posted on a YouTube channel. So they're video archived and there's over a hundred videos, which is a great, great, great resource for people. But he was hoping it would be the next major development. It didn't happen. And what he says is this emotional sobriety is a development of much more real maturity and balance in our life, which is to say humility, right? In our relationships with ourselves and our fellows God. But what is real maturity? Let's focus on that and balance. Well, real maturity is, is best defined as a transcendence from environmental support to self-support. We all start our life highly dependent on our environment, 100% dependent. When you are conceived inside your mother's you know, uterus, you are 100% percent dependent on her for everything that you need to grow and develop. 
She provides you with oxygen, with nutrients, with a safe place to grow until you're born. The minute we're born, yes, the umbilical cord is cut, but what does that mean? Well, it means our first act of self-support is to be able to breathe for ourselves. Now, it's very interesting how breath work becomes such an essential part of dealing with like anxiety, trauma. I mean, all kinds of work. It seems to all go back to our breath work. I think it goes back to that because that reminds us that we have the ability to support ourselves. We can breathe oxygen in and blow out the carbon dioxide that's created from, from how we process that oxygen. That's how we support ourselves. And that's the first example, the first experience is a better word for it, of self-support in our life. Well, we are hardwired to do that. Unless a child is neurologically impaired, you don't have to tell a child to breathe. You might have to kickstart it by smacking them on the butt a little bit or clearing some of the junk out of their throat. But that child wants to support their life. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> As you're going to see throughout this talk, I think that's our first experience with this life force inside of us that moves us towards greater and greater differentiation or actualization of self in our life. You and I are born with that. I think of it as God-given. That is God within us, moving us towards wholeness. The spiritual people would say moving us towards holiness, towards becoming complete. Suddenly, I realized what the matter was. My basic flaw had always been dependence, almost absolute dependence on people or circumstances to supply me with prestige, security, and the like. Failing to get these things according to my perfectionist dreams and specifications, I had fought for them. And when defeat came, so did my depression. Well, this was the aha moment that Bill had, and that really started to propel him in the direction of emotional sobriety. He realized that he was highly dependent on environmental support. Once again, totally appropriate when we're children and infants and young adults or adolescents. But as we become adults, we need to learn how to provide some of these things for ourselves and not be overly dependent on those around us. So he saw that his basic flaw had always been dependence. He called it almost absolute dependence on people or circumstances. It's blind with prestige, his self-esteem. His self-esteem was an other validated self-esteem. We know, and if you've been tuning in on Thursday nights, that true authentic self-esteem is your evaluation of yourself, not how other people think about you, whether they think you're great or not, but it's your reputation with yourself. The evaluation that you have of yourself. So that's real self-esteem. So security, emotional security means that people will do what I want them to do when they want to do it so that I feel okay in life. People will protect me <clears throat> and take care of my needs even when I'm not taking care of my own and the like. When these things didn't happen according to his perfectionist dreams and specifications, well, those perfectionistic dreams and specifications came from a lot of his unconscious adaptation to the challenges that he faced in his life growing up. You see, one of the things we will do that Dr. Bowen, uh, Alexander Lowen said, not Bowen, but Lowen, he said, if we have a trauma in our childhood, which I think we all do, that either impacts one or both, one are emotional security, or our sense of self-acceptance. So if our trauma does either of those things or both of those things, I think any trauma that would do one would do the other, by the way. He says, we are going to require that our future reverses the experience of our past. You see, that's what we call a characterological adaptation to trauma. Because if I require my future to change it, then I have hope that my life can be different. Because if not, I'm just going to fall into a terribly deep depression and be hopeless. This is why we see such an increasing number of childhood suicides. Because the kids have given up that there's any possibility of a better future. They're unable to do that. 
Now, later on, what we realize, and this is what relationships are for, and part of what I'm going through in my life, is that all of these unconscious compromises and rules that we set up end up colliding with reality. Now, if if you're in a relationship that it is is able to see the value in working through that, then you get to work on dealing with that and growing together. But that's not always possible. One person may or may not be available for that kind of work, and then it's just unfortunate. You got to wait for the next opportunity, and there will they will come. Trust me, they will come. This keeps circling around until you deal with it. That's one of the things we know. Freud used to call it the repetition compulsion. He thought it was based on a pathological adaptation. But those of us that are humanistic psychologists see that repetition is just another opportunity to finally, finally get some resolution on these things that are unresolved for us. So Bill, you know, fought for things. He tried to get people to do it his way. And when he got defeated, he got depressed. Some of us get depressed. Some of us get angry. Some of us both get depressed and angry. Some of us throw in the towel. We have all kinds of reactions to when things don't go our way. But the bottom line is, oftentimes what we do is we object to it. We say this shouldn't be happening to me. And we end up throwing a pity party. Oh my God, look at look at how much I've been victimized. Look at how terrible things are. That's unfortunate because when we're doing that, then we're not putting our energy into coping with what is. And the only way to resolve some of these things is to get busy with what is, not with what should be. The what should be's or the should demands on life will not help you grow yourself in this direction. Ernie Larson is saying very something very similar. I'm a big fan of Ernie Larson. We've lost him a number of years ago to cancer, but he's just left us a wonderful, wonderful resources and books on recovery. And one of the things he says in stage two recovery, which he says stage two happens after stage one, which is breaking the bonds of our addiction. Stage two is learning how to, to deal with life, learning how to love, learning how to have healthy relationships. It says, dealing with the mountain of living is what stage two recovery is all about. It's about getting on with life by facing those patterns, habits, and attitudes. That's what Bill was talking about when he talked about his absolute dependence. The patterns, habits, and attitudes that are created by that absolute dependence. If you have not done an inventory on that, I would encourage you to sit down and try to start reflecting on how has your emotional dependency created certain patterns in your life? What habits do you do follow from that dependency? And what kinds of attitudes is, is that help uh, is that developed or created in your life? He says, now you can get on with life by facing those patterns, habits, and attitudes that control your life, and which for perhaps the first time, you are clear-headed and sober or emotionally sound enough to face. Or insufficient amount of pain. I will add that now since that's part of the journey that I'm on. So let's talk about unpacking this process that leads to emotional sobriety when we work the 12 steps now. How can we start to tie this together? Well, if we look at these first three steps, which in my opinion really form the foundation, we're trying to put the foundation of our life on what Bill likes to call a firm bedrock. Something that creates, uh, it, it. I'll use the word unshakable, but th that gives the wrong impression that somehow we're not knocked off balance, that somehow we're going to be invulnerable. I don't mean it that way. I mean, when I say unshakable, is that even though you get knocked off balance, you have the ability to recover that balance. That even though something may hit you and knock you to your knees, which is where I've been now for several weeks, that I'm still finding a way through that. I'm still, you know, as my good friend Tom Catton said, is, is staying clean and sober sometimes is about not drinking and using when it would make a lot more sense to drink and use. Right, a lot more sense. I've been there. I had some very dark nights. So what happens in step one is we're going to see that we start to wake up. We, we have now a ruthless or radical honesty about really what's true in our life. We have to develop some hope and that we make a decision to develop a new consciousness is what's happening. But 
the steps we need to understand this to understand the power of them they're sequential and and they in and and operate and they're inter, interdependent operating from a charge discharge charge model now what do i mean by that well, each step is going to create a certain amount of emotional charge, a certain amount of energy for you. And we're going to see we get kicked off with step one by a powerful charge. It, it, it is totally deconstructs the very foundation that we built our life upon. Well, that throws us, as you're going to see, into an existential crisis. We cannot rely on the things that we were relying on before as a solution. It's as though somebody saw us out in the water floating on a pretty soggy life preserver, and they're going to say, all right, well, step one is we got to get that soggy life preserver out of your hand, so I'm going to pull it away from you. Well, guess what? If that's all you've been holding on to and you don't believe there's anything else, you're not going to let go of that thing. That's why lifeguards do not swim near you. They hand you a life preserver. They don't let you grab onto them, right? They do not, right? For that very reason. So that charge that happens in step one, this incredibly powerful experience now sets us up. It's almost like we're marinating, right? So we're getting tenderized for step two. And then step two resolves that charge. It discharges it and resolves that, that charge that was created. It's discharged in step two. And now a new charge emerges, which then moves us on to what's next. That process of this energy, you know, needing to be resolved, then getting resolved, and then creating a new energy propels us all the way through the steps. It's an incredibly powerful experience if you work them. I was with Tom and we both said, my God, after you work these for a while, you don't work the steps anymore. They just work you. <laughs> I mean, they become so integrated into our life. And that is possible if you, if you consciously work them. So now let's focus on step one. So step one says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Well, Oftentimes, we say there's two parts to this step. The first one is, is, is admitting our powerlessness over alcohol or whatever our drug of choice is, or whether it's an experiential addiction like pornography or gambling. So we have to see our powerlessness over this. Now, what makes that so important? Well, we're going to figure that out here in a minute. But it just doesn't finish with that, because what led us to turning to alcohol was that our life was unmanageable, <clears throat> meaning that we did not have the tools and the experiences that we needed to have when we were developing in our life to be able to meet life and make sense out of it for us, to be able to manage it. Well, you'll, you'll see what I mean by that as we go along here. So I see this first step and the therapeutic effect of that. Now, that's how I'm going to be different than Herb. Herb's going to talk to you more from the spiritual side of the matter. I'm going to be looking at the psychological side. So the psychological therapeutic effect of this step is the shattering of the false self and planting the roots of humility into our consciousness by creating an existential crisis. You see that person's head coming apart? That's shattering the false self. I love these images at times. Bill Wilson said this, we must awake or we die. You know, we are inflicted with an illness that if there is not some kind of a solution to it, it leads us to death, um, insanity, hospitalization, or incarceration. I just worked with a young man, <clears throat> I call him young, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> he's in his late 40s, very successful man, and uh, the family kind of turned to me for a last resort, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to reach him, but I did help his wife tremendously deal with it, but he drank himself to death, right before her eyes, drank himself to death, he was drinking over, over a fifth, 
sometimes a whole gallon of vodka every day. Hospitalized many, many times, been into many, many treatment programs, but there was no path. And he didn't wake up and he died. Thank God she woke up. So she was ready. She had a foundation to start to deal with that. Well, this is our solution to our addiction. You know, we, we never accept the fact that it might not be a good idea to take that cheese off the block, off that mice mouse trap, right? So instead, what we come up with is clever ways to reduce the harm. Well, maybe if I wear a helmet. So that's a, that's a soft cloth helmet. The mouse will try that and get whacked pretty good and then probably try to find a better material so that they don't get hit as hard. But we never think that, you know what, we don't need to cheese. We don't need to do this to ourselves. That's why some people are even describing alcoholism and his drug addiction as a failure to protect ourselves, that it's a safety issue, that our sense of self is so damaged, our self-esteem is so low, we don't see ourselves worthy of, of looking out for our best interest. Well, it's a sad state of affairs. Any of us that have been in that rat's position know what's going to happen next. It's all happened to us every time, over and over again. So what happens with step one here? Well, <clears throat> Bill says it this way. Change begins with a, this admission and awareness. We're going to talk about that the change that happens here is a paradoxical one, and I'll define that in a minute. But he says few people will sincerely try to practice the program unless they've hit bottom. See, what that does is it says, I can't rely on what I've been doing as a solution. It's an admission, not as clear as this, but it says, I can't solve a problem with the consciousness that created. I can't wake myself up with the information that put me in a trance. It just can't happen. Something new has to happen, and oftentimes it's pain. So total surrender creates this existential crisis. We are reduced in step one to a state of absolute helplessness. Now, most psychologists would go to great lengths to not feel, have you feel helpless. They would talk about your sense of personal agency and try to empower you. But this is sometimes where not trying to help can be very helpful. By surrendering to our absolute helplessness, that we start to experience a paradoxical change. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So in working this step, we see the fatal nature of our situation. I have an illness that if I don't find, if I don't arrest it, it's going to kill me. But I have no idea how to do that. And not only do I have an illness, but I have no idea how to live a life that's going to create a sense of I'm okay even if. See, that becomes the ultimate problem. I see many people who start off their recovery with the first half of step one, and they don't make it because they haven't looked at the issues regarding step two. A firm bedrock of our program needs to be the acceptance of both our powerlessness and our unmanageability. So Bill said that again, a little good could come to any alcoholic who joins AA unless he's first accepted his devastating weakness and all its consequences. There is something I'm unable to control. Now, anyone that steps outside and looks at our experience understands things that, hap that happen in our life are outside of our control. A lot of times we can't control the things that are happening. What we end up having to do is to deal with our response to those things. We have to claim the experience we're having and not let it claim much not let it claim us, which is what I'm in the process of trying to get wrap my head around it. So all of AA steps ask us to go against our natural desires. They all deflate our egos. I want you to replace ego with false self, right? I want you to think of that. The ego is really what Bill is talking about, a false self. From a psychological perspective, the ego is not a destructive thing. It has a lot of different elements, but it is the way that we make contact with reality. But Bill wasn't using it in the psychological sense. He was really describing our false self when he talked about ego. Oh, look at that. See that fire? Did you feel the heat? Put your hand up to the screen. You can feel the heat from that. 
Every natural instinct cries out against the idea of personal powerlessness. Every natural instinct. I would say every natural or every instinct that is grounded in our false self cries out against it. Because one of the things that happens that in our childhood, when we experience trauma or other situations that may not be at the level of trauma, what we, what we do with that experience is we try to find a way to control things when, when things aren't going the way we want them to go. So accepting you don't have control over something is tantamount with saying, I'm screwed here. Oh, my God, if that's the case, I might as well just push in all the chips now. How can I go on? Doesn't it take away all of my hope? Doesn't it take away any possibility? Now, this, by the way, in my profession, many, many professional psychologists and psychotherapists are very critical of the AA program. They think we're copying out when we talk about powerlessness. They say that we're abdicating responsibility for our drinking and for our lives. Now, I know from my own personal experience and as a psychologist that what we do in the program is a far cry from an abdication. At this point in my life, I'm taking more responsibility for myself than I have ever done so in my life, ever. And I think you have too if you've been working the steps. So... Letting go of this defiant self-reliance, I'll do this, I'll figure this out myself, is really the development, begins the development of some true humility in our life. Uh, Dr. Miller, the psychologist I'm working with right now, said to me the other day that alcoholism and other drug addictions are a disease of self-reliance. See, at first, what we do is we become self-reliant. I'm going to deal with this stuff. I'm not going to let anybody hurt me. I'm going to figure this stuff out or in whatever way we do. And there's a lot of different ways. We, we rely on self-reliance. He says, it doesn't work. He says, because you because the self-reliance cannot heal what caused that wound. It's nurturing and love and a lack of love and empathy and emotional attunement that caused the wound in us. And so any self-reliance is not going to do it. It's going to take us away from what we need, not towards it. And then when our own self-reliance doesn't work, we got to turn somewhere outside of ourselves, And that's when we turn to alcohol, other drugs, sex, people pleasing, whatever it is, food, we got all kinds of ways of trying. And then when that doesn't work, well, we hope if I find the right woman or the right man and they love me that I'll be whole again. Well, that doesn't work either. Guess what? We're left in the same thing. And then we try to become self-reliant again and we're back on the merry-go-round right? See, that's the pattern that we're talking about here. So we've got to find a way to disrupt it. Hopefully, step one will be the beginning of the disruption of that pattern. Now, I said I'm going to kind of put this in the context of how does how do the steps help us achieve emotional sobriety? Well, emotional sobriety is rooted in our authenticity, which means that emotional sobriety is in emotional sobriety, it's very important for us to, to experience who we truly are and for us to be grounded in the experience of ourself. Now, it's very interesting that Maslow recognized how important it is, right, to, this, to discover and to have our life grounded in our true self. He argued that a characteristic must be considered a basic need if it meets the following condition. If you don't have it, if you've lost your true self, it will breed a psychological illness. Well, I think that that's true for each and every one of us. The self that we developed to try to figure out life and stuff didn't work. That's what we're learning in step one. The second thing that Maslow recognized, that if we have it, it prevents illness. You see, I think this is what they're missing in a lot of the alcoholism and, and other drug addiction, as well as suicide prevention issues, is they're not helping kids get in touch with who they really are so that that true self, right, can be a protective factor in their life. Because when you don't have it, it's not. It's a risk factor. And then the third thing is, and this is what so many of us 
have discovered in the program that if we restore our true self, it cures our addiction. We would say it arrests it, but some people say I'm a recovered alcoholic. Either way works for me. I don't want to split hairs about it. I, I When I say recovered, I think of it as that you don't have problems anymore, which is we all know far from the, the truth. We have problems now. It's now it, that we face them in a very different, different way. So if we have a true self, it will prevent illness. If we lose it, it creates illness. When we restore it, it cures it. Now, this is the observation that Sigmund Freud made. He's made many contributions, some of which I disagree with, but this one is very important. And he talked about the discovery of the unconscious and the impact on our life. He said, we are being lived by the forces within ourselves. We are being lived by those. We are going to continue to be lived by these forces until we become conscious of those. Trust me, that consciousness happens at different levels. I've done a lot of work on myself. I'm only now seeing some things that I had a blind spot to that are being revealed to me quite starkly and quite painfully. But thank God they're being revealed. So maybe it, before I pass on this world, I can be open to receiving love from a partner and also giving the kind of love I'd like to be able to give. So we're going to experience what we're going to talk about what happened. What was the experience we had now that took us away from developing our true self into developing a false self? This is one of my favorite authors and psychologists. I think she's an unheralded genius in the world of psychology. Um, she made direct contributions to the development of Gestalt therapy. I'm a Gestalt therapist. And she goes through a variety of adverse influences. A child may not be permitted to grow according to his individual needs and possibilities. Now think about that. Well, what are some of these influences that happen? Well, I can give you an example um, on just one, but there's, I'm just going to touch on one thing. There's many things that we could talk about because it's, it's, it's really a, in a, a intersection, if you will, um, of all kinds of forces that interfere with our us growing according to our individual needs and possibilities. Let's say my little five-year-old, Cece, comes home from school and walks up and says, Daddy, Daddy, look at what I did at school today. Look at what I drew. Now, if I wanted to be a good daddy, you know what I would say to her? Based on what most fathers are taught today? Honey, that is terrific. It's outstanding. Thinking that if I give her positive feedback, I'm reinforcing her self-esteem in a good way. Well, I am reinforcing something. I'm, I will argue with you that I'm not reinforcing true self-esteem. I'm reinforcing an externally based self-esteem. So when Cece goes back to school and she's sitting there writing the next day, she's thinking, how is daddy going to like this? Is he going to be excited about this one? Well, what if he, she comes home and I'm not in a good mood and I don't applaud what she did at school? What happens to Cece? Well, she's disappointed. She may be crushed. She starts to think about what did I do wrong? How come daddy's not happy with me now? Well, let me see. Maybe I could do something that's going to get daddy happy with me. So you see what I've done by, by once again, not a bad intention, a good intention to reinforce her self-esteem. I've made her think about what matters to me rather than for her to think about what matters for her. Let's say CC comes home. And this time, I've listened to Dr. Berger's lecture. <laughs> she walks in the door and she goes, Daddy, 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 look at what I've done today. And instead of saying how great it is, I look at her and I say, Wow. I can see that smile on your face, sweetie. You really enjoyed what you did in school today. You sound like you're very proud of that. What do you like about it? What did it mean to you when you were doing that? How did that make you feel? And then at the end of it, I say to her, what do you want to do with that? And you know what, honey? It's important to do things that make you feel good inside like this did. 
She goes back to school after that. And what does she think? How do I like this? Now, did I permit her to grow according to her individual needs and possibilities? The first way? No, I took her away from herself. And so much happens. Maybe it's my leftover, um, you know, hallucinations from all the acid I dropped early on in my using days. But I think there's a conspiracy against us developing our true self. I really do. I don't think we know how to do it. I think society doesn't encourage it, especially in the culture I live in. This, this culture that's so much based on having and not on being. It takes us away from who we are and focuses on what we have. You know, it's it, there's so many things, and I can get so sad about all those things because they damage us. They traumatize us. Even if we don't have any specific trauma, I would just traumatize Cece if I did that to her, let alone the other stuff that's even more directly traumatic, right? So as a result, a child does not develop a feeling of belonging of we, but instead of profound insecurity and a vague apprehensiveness, she used the term to describe that basic anxiety, a fear that I'm not going to be loved, that I'm not going to be accepted, that I'm not going to belong. My God, the trauma I'm dealing with now is I see so clearly how damaged I've been with this and how self-reliant I've been my whole life. So the cramping pressure, cramping means it, it, we implode with it. It's cramping. It's not an expansive pressure that opens up possibilities. Now we have to kind of circle the wagons. The camping pressure of this basic anxiety prevents the child from relating to himself or herself and others with the spontaneity of real feelings and forces that child to find a way to cope with them. Self-reliance. At the core of this alienation from the actual self, because that's what's starting to happen. At a very young age, we start to fragment ourselves. We start to fragment our personality. So this core, this alienation from the actual self is the loss of feeling of being an active determining force in our own lives. We feel now controlled by life and the situations in life and how other people treat us and and then we react to it it's we're based on stimulus response at this point in time we are no longer an active determining force in our own lives and this can happen subtly this really happened to me in my marriage at this point in time i really lost myself so the energy energies driving towards self-realization are shifted to the aim of actualizing the idealized self. That's the false self. The idealized self being the images, the fantasies, the ideas we have. If I could only be this way, I would be okay even if. That's what we think the idealized image is going to do. But because it's conditional, you can't get to I'm, I'm okay even if. It's an impossibility. So when the real self is locked out or exiled, one's integrating power will be at low ebb. You need to be able to integrate your experiences to grow towards what you can be, to become whole, to become more differentiated, to be able to stand on your own two feet in life. If you are unable to integrate your experiences, you are going to be fragmented in your development as a person. The more fragmented you are, the more fixed your behavior is going to be, the more rigid it's going to be, and the more stereotyped it's going to be. It's not going to be spontaneous. It's not going to be real. You're going to be worried about being a certain way so that you're liked and okay, or getting people to feel a certain way about you so you can be liked and okay. That's how we get lost. Fritz Perl said it a different way, but it's the same idea, and he he, he ended up a patient of 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 Dr. Horney for a period of time, she analyzed him. He goes, many people dedicated their lives to actualize a concept of what they should be like rather than actualize themselves. This is again the curse of the ideal, the curse that you should not be what you are.
So I just graphically put it in this model. This is how we start out. You can see that in any child, they are free to be themselves. They don't want to be anything other than they are. They're just loving life. And then all of a sudden, the basic anxiety comes in, right? Here it comes. That basic anxiety creates what we call, or what Dr. Horn, I call the search for glory. I need to find a solution that's going to make me feel okay. That's the search for glory. If I find it, my life will be glorious. If not, I'm screwed, right kind of a thing. That leads us to develop this idealized self, this false self. That false self and the idealized self obviously evolves through life based on our cognitive development, our consciousness, but it is characterized by should demands and now creates a tyranny of the shoulds. The shoulds run our lives. We don't. This is where we lost the capacity to be a determining force in our own lives. So we get alienated from our true self. My idea is, is that if we could somehow reach inside of a person and measure the degree of alienation from their true self, we would be able to get a sense of how disturbed a person is, how diseased they are, how self-reliant they become, how dependent on their environment. Because remember, we change ourselves to be this because our basic anxiety is what? To be loved, to be accepted, to belong. And so we're changing ourselves to manipulate how other people feel about us. That's the goal of this whole operation. When we behave in a way that is not acceptable to ourselves, to our should demands, we hate ourselves for it because it generates so much anxiety that I'm not going to be loved or accepted. And so we have to squash any behavior that falls outside of those, you know, parameters that we set very early on in our life. Just another way to look at the same model that we have, right? That that we start with this true self. Then there's this, I want to be loved and accepted. It generates this, I'm afraid no one will love me and accept me. I won't belong. Now we search for that glory. You know, we burn in hell. No, <laughs> I, like, I do, like these fires, right? You guys feel that? So now it creates this false self, this idealized self. That's our solution. So we have a tyranny of, of the shoulds. It creates a pride system. And pride, when we are how we should, we reward ourselves. When we're not, we hate ourselves, trying to keep ourselves in line. And that's where the despised self comes in. I love this poem by Rumi. I have lived my life knocking on the door of insanity. Finally, one day the door opens. I realize I've been knocking from the inside. I have lived my life knocking on the door of insanity. Finally, the door opens. I think I'm going to be free, right? Or I think I'm going to finally go in there. But I realize I've been knocking from the inside. I, I'm crazy. I tell everybody I, I get a lot healthier the more I realize how crazy I am. I'm really going through that now. But this is what happens. When we finally can start admitting what's going on and what's happening for us, that's when change occurs, not when we try to become something we're not. This was the, the discovery that, that Dr. Beiser had. He was an early Gestalt therapist, and he talks about the paradoxical theory of change. So change occurs when, when one becomes what he is, not when he tries to become what he is not. That's what step one does. That's how it propels change. We accept our powerlessness, our unmanageability. Yes, we go kicking and screaming and struggling and resisting before we get it. But once we accept and admit this, you know, we talk all the time on Thursday nights now about how acceptance is a prerequisite for change. And that's what we're seeing here. This is Michael Singer, his book, The Untethered Soul. I love a lot of the things Michael says. We also have some different ideas. But I love this one. He says, if you dare to look at, you will see that you have built your entire life based on the model you have built around yourself. The model of what? The false self. And all of the shoulds that come with it. So this is it. We treat ourselves like a bonsai tree. We cut off branches. To, in our idea, 
or in our idealized version of who we should be, our idea that, boy, you're going to love me and accept me if I look like this. But to pull that off, we pay a high price. We lose ourselves. We get disconnected from ourselves. We shut off parts of ourselves that we need to function in life. Instead of becoming alive, we deaden ourselves. We restrict ourselves. We compromise ourselves. We don't know how to really protect ourselves and get our needs met because we're so busy trying to, to be this self that we think we need to be. The fostering of the phony self is always at the expense of the real self. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We have each and every one of us paid a terrible price for this. And it's quite tragic. It's quite sad. I'm hoping that as our consciousness starts to get raised and becomes greater and greater, that we're going to start to be able to help change this world. Because the only way this world is going to change is if we change our consciousness. It's not going to change through politics. Politics aren't going to do it. It's going to be through our individual raising of our consciousness. Now, this is what she says happens, which I think is a great insight. And it tells you what the therapeutic value of the tell steps are. She goes, the ver therapeutic fact in the disillusioning process. Now, the disillusioning process, it means no longer believing that your false self and the way that you've been living in your life is the solution, that you become disillusioned with it. This disillusioning process becomes very important, whether it's in terms of our relationship with ourselves. I'm learning now that this disillusioning process is an important process that every relationship goes through. And if it's met right by the way she's talking about it, then it lies in the possibility that when we become disillusioned, those it weakens the obstructive forces of the false self. They no longer have the control over us that they once had. We're now at least have reasonable doubt, hopefully more than that by the time we're done with step one, that this is not going to work. And with that, now the constructive forces of the real self have a chance to grow. That's what takes place here. But you can see how important it is that it's based on our acceptance. So this is it. This is how we can grow. Everything that that oak tree needed to become what it is today was in this little acorn. Now, yes, the acorn was incredibly, for a long period of time, dependent on the environment to support it before it could support itself. But after it grows into this wonderful tree, it's supporting itself in interaction with the environment. It still needs the environment. It still needs to interact with the environment to take in its nourishment, to take in water for the photosynthesis process, for all of the things that go on. But every bit of that information lied in that little acorn. And if the acorn was fortunate enough to be to have all those conditions met, it can grow, and grow into this amazing mature tree. That's true for you and I. Same thing. Problem is, none of us get those, those experiences we need. So we don't get, well, some, we may end up looking like that, but because there's also a bit of true self in every false self that we develop. More about that later if it's pro. So this is it. Step one is helping us grow this beginning of, of recovering ourselves. Now, Bill said it in his letter, we had to cart before the horse. Because our solution to life was to control things rather than learn how to deal with things. And when you use controlling everything and self-reliance as a solution, it's going to not work, just like putting a car, horse behind a cart is not the best possible form of transportation. So I will end this part with only the best in us can see the worst in us. Only the best in us can begin to see how reliant we have become on this false self and how emotionally dependent that's created us. So Bill said this, and just wrapping this up, is that recovery is dependent upon a spiritual experience set upon a pedestal of hopelessness. This creates our existential crisis. So now I'm in that situation where, look, my life isn't working anymore, right? Um, 
I'm in trouble. I'm in big trouble. I have no idea what I'm going to do to solve this problem. And so I'm screwed. That's the existential crisis that creates an existential anxiety, right? That anxiety is like, oh my God, you know, I didn't realize how really messed up I really am. And I am, and I have no idea what's going to happen next. So you see the charge that's being built, right? Oh my God, this awareness of what's really going on and the truth in my life is now you know, exploding. First it implodes, but now it's going to explode. Oh, shit. You know, I'm up that river with, I'm up the creek without a paddle, we have a saying in, 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 in America. You know, I'm up the creek without a paddle. And we realize that there's currents that are driving me all over the place. Now what? Now what do I do? Well, that's the setup for step two. <laughs>